My name is Fan Kuang Hong. If you are Catholic, you can call me Mikay or Michael Fan Kuang Hong. I am a priest of the Archdiocese of Perth, which is far from Sydney. I was a lost sail brother for 40 years. In 2003, I decided to become a priest. So the first joined the Archdiocese of Perth. I have been a priest for 17 years. That is a brief summary of my life. I was born in the Beau San Luo Maternity House, which everyone in Tandin District 3 knows. It is located at the end of High Botran Street, near the intersection of Tran Quan Khoi Street and the Q Bridge. I lived on Nguyen Van Mai Street, which is also known as Riduo Mumzo, the intersection of Hai Botrang and Hain Tin Kua. Therefore, when I was young, my parents sent me to school at the Daughters of Charity School, the Infuok School in Tandin. Perhaps I was too mischievous. So one day to nuns took me across the street to the Las Ale Brothers School. They opened a small door and let the brothers take care of me. So from then on, from grade two, I went to school with the Los Ale Brothers. I studied there until I finished grade four, which was called the first level of secondary school. Then I applied to join the Los Ale Order. So my childhood was spent as a student of the Daughters of Charity and the Los Sale Brothers. I grew up and studied in secondary school with the Los Sale Brothers. Regarding the education system in South Vietnam during the years I was there, I have two feelings. First, I am grateful for it because it was very humane and respected human beings. In the true sense of the word, I was taught everything a human being needs to develop, intellectually, morally, and physically. I feel that this is very precious, especially in schools run by religious men and women. I also learned about the catechism to learn about God. Looking back, I see that in just a few years, the South had built a very valuable educational foundation that produced people who were truly human. I feel sorry that it is no longer being continued. When people abandon the very normal subject of civic education, it is completely abandoned. So I don't know where the young people, the future generations, will go if we only use the end to justify the means. Then what is left of human conscience and basic morality? Do you agree with me, if I am not mistaken? Civic education is not just about having a civic education class. There were also books that I studied. And the national language books also talked about how a child should help an old person. And how a child should look at the national flag. In the national language book, I felt that what I read then is still valuable today. Even now, without a civic education class, Teachers and nuns taught us how to respect others, how to say yes when we mean yes and no when we mean no, how to practice what our duties require us to do, but to do it out of love, not out of obligation. I will never forget those things, especially with the spirit of being trained in religious schools. I also believe that public schools have similar civic education classes, so that is the foundation. I think that is what makes a human being a human being. Before anything else, I did not directly participate in the war. But my family was full of military personnel of the Republic of Vietnam Armed Forces. I was exempted for religious reasons. Exempted for religious reasons by Major General Bidindang. I later met him in society, and he passed away on January 15, 1975. My younger brother died in action in that sun, southern mountains. My parents and I went to collect his body. When the war had already started to escalate in the central region, in Phuc Long, Bin Long, etc., I kept thinking one thing. At that time, I told my students in Thu Duc that I felt sorry for the South. Although my view may be distorted, I said, Poor South. Having to resist, resist, 
resist. Find every way to resist. But never be allowed to break out and counterattack. It was a passive position. As if someone was forcing it to do so. So I could see the defeat ahead. I read a French language newspaper called Information Cartoonic. That predicted six months in advance that the South would lose. Everyone was worried, especially the older people, and very sad. That experience, coupled with the death of my brother earlier, and the death of an uncle of mine in a tank a short time later, when the communists were first equipped with B-40 weapons, made me realize that there was no way out. I felt very pessimistic. If I did not have faith in God, I might not have dared to stay in the South. The proof is that I could have left, but I stayed. Most of the brothers in the La Salle order left by boat. We who stayed were a small minority, about a quarter or a third. With the very old brothers, life changed completely. I was in charge of the novitiate near through dark. The novices went home, leaving only a small group in Nortrang and Dolat who could not return. Because there was no way to travel, it was there that we began to experience what hunger was like. That wasn't really significant. But the biggest fear was the complete lack of knowing what the future would hold. It was unclear. And when I saw people at the Thu Duck Market tearing up and burning books from the south, and cheering, it was incredibly sad, walking from Ngoi South School to the Thu Duck Market. I saw those things and felt so sorry for a regime that had been destroyed in vain. Therefore, if I talk about my feelings from the so-called liberation to the day I was imprisoned, it was only a few years, but I witnessed the cultural destruction, the so-called decadence, and especially the first currency exchange, which was incredibly tragic in the religious community. How many people were able to exchange 200 dong? From then on, we had to buy koi sweet potatoes according to the household registration system. Sometimes, we brought them home only to find that they were rotten and inedible. In late 1975, we were allowed to go to the ward to buy one meter of fabric each. I wanted white fabric, but the other guy wanted black fabric. One meter was not enough to make long pants. So we had to make shorts. We played a prank by exchanging our shorts. So one of us had white on one side and black on the other. It was a funny experience, but it also showed that we had no vision for the future. We heard rumors of priests and monks disappearing, either fleeing the country or being imprisoned. We heard of our loved ones gradually disappearing. And it was very painful. But we still tried to live on, because our younger siblings were relying on us. In 1976, I was invited to teach again at my old school. In 1977, the school was confiscated and we had to move to a nearby school in Bak Nin. The school was called Bak Nin Secondary School No.2. After six months, we were all assigned to do completely different things, such as taking care of the kitchen, maintaining order, buying tires, and distributing land to teachers and staff. In other words, we were responsible for basic necessities. So that year, my colleagues and I quit teaching and used the school's old car, a 32-seater Renault from France to turn it into a bus and go to Nortrang City. We registered the car and tested it before running it. We ran the bus until we were arrested and imprisoned. Ironically, each time we returned, the surplus gas money and the money collected from the customers, even though we didn't overcharge, was twice the monthly salary of a teacher. At that time, Teachers were paid 33 dong and 50 cents. We sometimes earned 70 dong each, which was a lot of money. So thanks to that, we could eat less koi and buy corn, rice, and other food. Of course, 
We couldn't buy it according to the household registration book. But we bought it in Din Kwon and other places and brought it back along the route I ran, which was from Saigon to the new economic zone in Dongheap, about 125 kilometers away. The new economic zone in Dong Heap was another four kilometers away. That was a period of time for me to experience what life was like. Under the so-called socialist regime, which was very fair, I will recount the events of 1978. When five major religious orders were attacked, Folk Sun, Dominican, Don Bosco, Lausanne, and the Holy Saviour. On January 2nd, 1978, they attacked my religious order. I was arrested on January 3rd, 1978, because I was present at my house in Long Trong. To Loi Fu Hu Agricultural Farm, Long Trong Commune. Through Duck District, I was representing the religious order to go to the old priests to do. Waterworks, when they came to the farm, they arrested me. After a day, the director of the public security department at that time, Mike Kaido, had a plan. It was clear that the attack on Folk Sun was not just a search, and they probably found guns and grenades under the pond of the fathers and teachers. They also searched the Holy Savior order and found a smith, and Wesson revolver on the roof of the closet in the warehouse of Father Tian Lok who had recently passed away, so that was the pretext. In civilization, there was no other way. I also knew that at Don Bosco, they used the pretext of harboring an illegal priest, Father Be the Long. At my religious order, they used the pretext of resting to brothers who were distributing leaflets. At Bakhnin Secondary School, those two brothers were arrested before Christmas. On December 17th and 18th, we heard that they were arrested, but we still didn't believe that it would happen to us, so no one escaped. But where could we escape to? It was all over the news, and there were dozens of people like that, including so many brothers, old priests, and all the others, so no one went anywhere. We celebrated Christmas happily. And I went to the Tulo Agricultural Farm on New Year's Day. On the second day, I went to the farm. I didn't know what had happened at home until the third day, when they took me back and I saw that the school was full of police. And the teachers had all been taken away. Old and young, everyone was put in jail. So I went in too. After a day, I was locked up in a dark cell. I heard a voice reading the rules of the prison. The voice was impossible to mistake. It was Father Joseph. My heart sank. So, the Holy Savior Order had been rested too. And indeed, the Folk Son Order had also been rested and thrown in with me. The best part was that they brought Father Fu Fam Van Hin and Father An, who is now a priest, into the cell with me. I was handcuffed behind my back, so they took off the handcuffs, which felt like a relief. The dark room was stuffy, so they put Father Fu Fam Van Heen on my right side and Father and on my left side, and said, Stay here. They slammed the door shut, and it was dark again, since I had been in the dark for a few days before. When they opened the door slightly, I saw faces. I recognized Father Fu and Father An. I also knew Father An because he is a very good musician. So they closed the door again and Father Fu said to Father An, Be careful of the one in the middle. He's an informant they planted here, so speak in French. Thankfully, French is my native language. The two fathers talked to each other in French, and I listened to everything, but I kept quiet. The best part was that after two or three hours, Father Fu said to Father An, I really need to use the bathroom, but this guy's hand keeps touching me. Take off his pants. Then, Lieutenant Colonel Pham Hon Thu, 
The director of the public security department of Thuduk district opened the door and answered, So, Lausanne and Fuoksan, have you gotten acquainted yet? The next morning, Father Fu looked at me and said, Why didn't you say anything last night? You scared me and father and have to death. I said, What was I supposed to say? I just wanted to enjoy the situation, so he took me to another place for two days. I didn't see him again. I was back in the dark once more. These were some of my early experiences while still in the Thu Dok detention center. They then transferred me to Fafandangu Street, near Bochu Market. There, I was finally able to share a cell with Father Chen Lok and six other priests including Father Nguyen Hao with his Moscow accent and many others, including Father Nguyen Chien Kao. Later, they took me to the public security department to prepare for trial, warning me not to observe or do anything against them. From the public security department, they brought me to Kaihoa prison. After three months in Kaihoa, I went to court. The judge's name was Dang Than and I don't remember the names of the prosecutors and so on. But that day I finally came face to face with Father Nguyen Van Vang and his younger brother, Major Nguyen Van Veen. Major Veen was a paratrooper who trained in the same class as General Engo Kwong Trong, but because he followed the group that opposed President Ingo Din Diem and Colonel Lau, he remained a major and never got promoted. Otherwise, he would have become a general. They were called the mastermind and the plan of the anti-communist interfaith group. Father Vang was the president and his brother, Major Veen, was the prime minister, according to Maikai, though. The day before the trial, they took us to the National Institute of Administration on Tran Kwok Tone Street. They were doing some kind of event there, and I wanted to know where I was because I was suffering from amnesia. But when they opened the doors, I recognized the soundings and knew it was Tran Kwok Tone Street. Then, that day, they presented for of us to the press and the public, especially the superiors of the religious orders. Bishop Bin was also invited, as well as Bishop Nam and all the superiors of the male and female religious orders were packed into the auditorium. Colonel Tho then declared, for a long time, We have captured Nguyen Van Vang, but you all kept joking that he was fake gold. Today, I present the real gold to you. Nguyen Van Vang was mocked like that. They then brought out Father Vang, his brother, and then me. Along with Father Long and a superior brother from my order, Brother Dao, so. They threw in a commendation certificate on the second day. Along with nothing but grenades, I managed to collect almost a barrel full, which I then submitted. They threw in the commendation certificate again on the third and fourth days, but seeing what they were doing, I threw it down the well and escaped. They came in and used a device to check if there were any more weapons or grenades in the well, but they brought me to court to be. Sentenced, the court held a single day hearing, both the trial court and the appellate court, with no appeals allowed. In my opinion, it seemed fair on the surface, as everyone had a defense lawyer. I had a female defense lawyer who... When we met privately three days before the trial, came all the way to Kaihoa to meet Father Vang, Major Veen, and everyone else. I don't know about the others, but my elderly lawyer kept advising me to be honest in court and not contradict the prosecution. Otherwise, they would increase my sentence. From then on, I didn't want to talk to her anymore and didn't speak at all. When the trial came... There was no lawyer present, only the prosecutor and the judges. There were no witnesses in the courtroom, and there was no arguing. They just read the indictment, which was nearly 200 pages long. They accused Father Vang of many crimes, and the same for Major Veen. My case was thinner. 
as it only involved being connected to them. Not directly involved, however, they included me out of spite. To have an excuse to confiscate five of the largest religious institutions in Thudok. Of course, before April 30th, 1975, many parishes in the south knew Father Vang because he was a famous orator of the Holy Saviour Order. Known for his loud, clear voice and captivating presentation, everyone knew his name. After April 30th, 1975, he stopped preaching publicly. But he did organize an anti-communist interfaith group. This was true, and as far as I know, Major Veen was involved before April 30th, 1975, through a middleman, Loyo Trong Din Du. I say this because if Loyo Trong Din Du is still alive, he would have to admit it, because during the trial, I heard Father Vang say that he was promised help by a lawyer named Trong Din Chuan. And the last meeting was on the 10th, on December 12, 1977, at the Bean Hoa Military Cemetery, Mr. Trong Din Du was present, along with several others. After I was released from prison, I was able to stay with both Father Vang and Major Veen. However, after being transferred from Kaihoa, I never saw Major Veen again. He was executed by firing squad. Father Vang was transferred to Campy 20, where he lived with us until the day he died. Father's death was not due to illness, but rather an accident. It was very clear that it was an accident, as someone had been planted to study the faith with him. Father saw a man who was eager to study the faith, a prisoner, and he guided me in the same way that Father Kwong in did. This was Father Nguyen Van Min, the same one from the Lai Tai to Church incident in 1976. A police officer named Nguyen Rang Ren was shot and killed. It was the same with Father Min. Someone was planted to study the faith, and after Father finished teaching, they presented evidence. So, the internal rule prohibiting proselytizing was to lock up the proselytizer. He was locked up, and Father Vang was also locked up. His feet were shackled to an iron bar. How could he go anywhere? He could only walk back and forth along the iron bar. He was alone in the room. When he first arrived, he was in the same room as journalist Vuan, who has also passed away. Vu and wrote a very good article about Father Vang, commemorating the days when they were together in prison. Vu and was also imprisoned for being unyielding, and publishing the legal newspapers in prison. He was locked up for months. His food and water rations were reduced, but he still survived. So, when they had the intention, I think, to kill Father Vang, they moved him to a different room. He was not allowed to stay with the journalist. On one morning, the gods came to open the door to take out the chamber pot. Father was dead. He had a mark on his head, here, deep down. And blood was oozing out because he lay there and took it. How could it be like that? It was like Fan opened the door a bit and then closed it again. The case is still shrouded in secrecy, and no one knows who did it. The person who did it would never say that their evil act was. Done in the prison where I stayed the longest, perhaps at a twenty Dongjuan for conferred years. The previous ones were in temporary detention centers. They called Kaiho a temporary detention center. But the Camp 20 Don Juan Fukun was very happy. But the most terrible thing was the constant hunger. The gnawing hunger. The most terrible thing was that. In the winter in the central region, the colder it was, the hungrier we were. But as long as we went to work, we had something to eat. Any kind of vegetable or animal. If you didn't move, you were considered defeated. With the hands of a prisoner, if you could catch it, you would eat it. Grasshoppers and locusts were called flying shrimp, roasted until they were red like shrimp.
Lizards disappeared from the coconut trees. None of them were left alive. They were considered extinct. They hit the coconut base to make it run out. And then they caught it and roasted it immediately. They ate it on the spot, squeezing snails and toads. So that time was also the time when I learned the most. Because in that camp, it was not a temporary detention center anymore. They left us outside until dark before locking us up. Of course, being outside was within the barbed wire. And when we went to work, there were guards with guns. But it was still more comfortable and healthier because there was sunshine. Even if we were digging ponds, chiseling stones, or cutting firewood in the forest. Especially cutting down those low oak trees. Accidents happened all the time. If the low oak tree was not cut properly, it would bounce up and cut off the head. The edge of the tree was so sharp that it would cut across and decapitate many people. When chiseling stones, if there was no eye protection, the chirps from the brother next to you could fly into your eyes. But it was still better because you could see the outside and there were ways to survive. You could eat any kind of grass, even thorny grass. Look at the thorns, they don't sting. Boil it until the thorns are soft and eat it all. So, if I talk about the memories of living in the collective at A20, I'm only afraid of the hunger that tortures everyone. It tortured them to the point where many people were willing to lose their dignity. It was pitiful. And the most frightening thing, during my temporary detention was the time I was locked in a dark cell. The loneliness laughs. All day long I did nothing but conjugate French verbs. Trying to remember, I also recited stories I had read outside of prayer time. At prayer time, we would pray in a low voice and then drink water. So, when I was released and joined the collective, especially at Camp 20, every night I would tell stories I had read as a child. And they called me the movie projector with a laugh. Every room with a movie projector was praised. For the first six months, the results were positive. The room was praised for being the most orderly, with no fighting or arguing, because everyone wanted to sit and listen to stories at night. Stories like The Smiling Proud Wanderer, The Deer and the Cauldron, The Hero Dies, The Romance of the Three Kingdoms, and The History of the Legalist School by Lin Bao. Of course, if I couldn't remember the details, I would make them up. Even now, when former inmates meet, they still call me the movie projector. You know, it felt good to show movies because who could visit me? Poor and orphaned, who would fill me for a glass of lemonade. It was incredibly precious, and we drank it slowly. Until one point. They saw that I no longer posed a threat of escape or anything, so they showed me a letter. They gave me an envelope without any paper, and told me to write on the triangular flap of the lid, and then push it back. There are many funny stories about this. One of my friends, an Air Force officer, was also overjoyed. His wife was in Longan. He was from the South. He knew... And so did I. I read it. I saw him write, Honey, we're very poor. Buy something relatively cheap. No one sells it. So, he starved and was cold. He had one packet of sugar, and it showed how much they cared. That's when I started to write about the provincial superior brother at the time. Brother Joe Senhonja. He began sending people to visit me. And the person he found was my own sister, who was willing to go because it was her brother. So, she went to the convent, and whatever they gave her, she took it with her. Everyone was poor alike. So, she took a bus to the ingerbock Junction. From Tuhoe to there, which must be a few dozen kilometers more. And then from the ingerbock Junction to the camp, about twenty kilometers. On a mountain road, 
crossing the Taubang River. It was very difficult, but she visited me from then on. I felt happier because I had contact, a way to survive, occasionally. We would get a package of sesame seeds, so you ask why no one visited. Because of the mountains, they kept their principle of not letting anyone travel anywhere. And no one knew if you were alive or dead. There were times when I felt hopeless. In the first two weeks, I wanted to commit suicide. For example, right now, during martial arts practice, your two eyes are very important. Stand on one leg with your eyes open. You can still stand. Close one eye, you already start to sway. Close both eyes, and you fall down immediately. So, the eyes with light make you balanced and alive. I measured the distance. I could see the shapes and colors. That was life. Now, in the dark, I couldn't even see my knee if I put my hand out and touched it. It felt strange, and I had difficulty breathing. And I felt very dizzy and disoriented. I couldn't sit still, and I couldn't lie down either. It felt like seasickness. It was horrible. Anyone who is in complete darkness for one or two months will experience it, and I only experienced it for the first two weeks. It was better to sit down even if my leg hurt. But sitting down allowed me to bite my tongues, that the blood would come out slowly. It wouldn't be a painful death, just a sharp sting at that moment. But surely, as the blood slowly came out, the death would be from blood loss, not anything else. It would be a silent death. But then, luckily, I heard the sound of firecrackers outside in 1978. They were still allowed to light firecrackers. I suddenly remembered that people outside were celebrating Tet. While we were here not knowing, we knew there was a change. A whole group of brothers from the Mosa order in Thuduk were all dot imprisoned, but didn't know where. We knew they were in Thuduk, but we weren't allowed to see them. However, hearing the firecrackers, I wondered. Time is still passing. It's still moving forward. Why am I cutting off my own time? If I die, I'm cutting myself off. I'm no longer present. I've lost the gift that God gave me. Now I had to change. I had to live. I had to practice breathing again to ease the shortness of breath. In the darkness, it was suffocating. It was terribly suffocating, like someone pressing on your chest. And the loneliness, I mentioned it before, but it was suffocating. Difficult to breathe and disorienting. Then, from that moment, I thought again, no, I can't die. I have to live, I have to return. And truly, thanks be to God, I was able to return. So, coming out of the dark room, I went down to Fafandang Lu Street. I immediately met a kind soul, a prison official, or rather, the head warder. He had beautiful handwriting. The prison guard called me Kai to head prisoner. Oh my God, thank you so much. He offered me the position of ward leader. Thank you, Lord. I'm a total mess right now. He said, in prison, my teeth had naturally fallen out. From top to bottom, there's nothing left, he said. He meant that two or three teeth were left, but they were uneven. Poor things. It was a happy time there, with Chen Lok and five other priests. We lived in a room with one hundred brothers, the size of which was probably smaller than this space. We even had to take turns sleeping, sitting and lying down. There wasn't enough space, but it was happy. It was happy because we were able to connect. You see, connection makes you human. Isolation turns you into an island and a wild animal. So, having connection, I began to feel happy living there. I learned many things. 
including learning the tricks of pickpocketing and snatching necklaces from young inmates. Although I never used them, I also learned card games and foreign languages with Father Chen Lok quite extensively. I interacted with several elderly Chinese men, all older than me. They were imprisoned for being wealthy, called bourgeoisie capitalists. I shared a room with the King of Kubota Tractors, the King of B-40 Fishing Nets, and the King of Hong Kong Cinema at that time. Eden Cinema was under his control, you see. He was very wealthy. So, from the next morning, those gentlemen were very kind. Then, on the second day, there were former members of the Guomintang, Chiang Kai-shek's party, and some Chinese people who were all editors of famous newspapers in Cholon. They were suspected, so they were all locked up. It's a shame. The newspaper owner, the editor-in-chief of the Viendong newspaper, died there. He died lying next to me. I don't know, but he didn't wake up in the morning for a roll call. I felt cold, and so those gentlemen, poor things, said, Here, let me show you. Let's teach you how to speak Cantonese, son. Those gentlemen were so happy. You're tall, very tall. He said, Can you teach me Vietnamese? I'm most grateful to Mr. Hein Hai Bin. After I came back from prison, I looked for him, but his children said he had passed away. He had returned, but he was weak and then died. He was the one who taught me how to find inner peace most effectively. He taught not only me, but also Chien Lok, the two most exemplary students. Never absent and always completing our lessons, very quickly, and felt happy, didn't he? But he had to be discreet, because the regulations prohibited propagating religion, banned the spread of languages. So he had to learn quietly. Just leave that plastic bowl there, with nothing made of porcelain or metal. Plastic can be marked with water on cement, for example. The word compassion written. How could anyone pretend to pour water from the bowl and tear it clean, find some roots to sit on, pretend to drink water, then mark it? Then you score it. You say whoever owns this paper is good at writing. I learned with, and the person I am most grateful to is Mr. Lak Taha, older than me. He used to be a landowner. But now they've confiscated it to turn it into a tourist area. Dan Sen. Just because he was wealthy. Poor guy. So, he taught me Cantonese, and I learned Vietnamese. Both sides exchanging languages, called communist languages, said to be mutually beneficial. Thanks to that, I found those months meaningful and enjoyable. And if I have to say... I mimic St. Paul saying, all is grace. From accidents to loneliness, illness, and weakness. Many died. The first cause was malaria. The second hunger from eating the wrong food. I remember my dear friend ate potato sprouts, died. The government's policy was to stack potatoes. It was Indian wheat, not for eating, but for handicrafts. Its plastic would be made into goods, toxic material, because its yield was about 5 to 10 kilograms, while the Indian wheat could yield up to 40 kilograms, bigger than my thigh, very fragrant, delicious when boiled. Many died, especially that man. People forbade eating potatoes, calling it stealing from the Malflau camp. He only broke its sprouts, Soak them in salt to make pickles. Their smell was good. A friend of mine ate it once. Died of the hot mushroom's fragrance. Seemed like vanilla. He shared with me once, which I kept for later. Hadn't eaten yet when he roasted it. Finished eating. Collapsed into the fire. His mouth produced yellowish saliva. Like vanilla color of the mushroom on the fly's underside. It stuck to it. 
He died. I stood, said, Thank you, God. I haven't eaten. He shared with others, who also hadn't eaten. So, they gradually brought it out. The second case might die, from being beaten to death if they resisted. I saw an ethnic girl beaten to death in front of. Other prisoners, especially those who failed to escape. The worst was the torture. Beating. Poisoning. It happened easily like a daily meal. Certainly, people died from excessive flogging. Father Nguyen Van Min died from excessive flogging, up to twenty for times, because of hunger in prison. They gave a bowl of rice with salty water, due to high blood pressure. Eating just that, it's certain death. They'd say it's settled if someone died. If someone's good, they're considered vin, treated differently. Not as humans, but with solidarity. If anyone resists, they would die. I saw a fellow inmate killed in front of others, especially those who tried to escape and failed. They brought them back, beat them to death on the spot. No more words. I didn't feel sorry for them. They sought revenge by forcing them to hunt in the jungle, dragging them back along the road, beaten to death on the spot. I thought they had many reasons to die. Death from hunger was fewer when out of prison, but death from illness, accidents. Eating wrong food was more common. Death from torture, poisonings. Was real, as easy as eating rice, of course, some died from forced labor. Two, Father Nguyen Van Min died from overworking. In prison, they gave a bowl of rice a day with salty water. With high blood pressure, eating just rice with salty water would surely die. I must say they considered it settled. They said it's settled. Whoever dies, it's settled. If they could, they'd say... It's settled. They use the term settled completely arbitrarily. Treating people like things, not humans, together. So no one would complain. But strangely, they celebrated when someone died. Thinking they were relieved, while we were still suffering. Thinking to such an extent is pessimistic. I felt it was the end of the world. I intended to escape. I was easy to let go because they let me out to decorate weddings outside. My people managed to escape. But fate or the deity ranged for me to stay with my superior, my master's brother. At that time, he was seven years old. Wherever he went, we were like brothers, eating together. So I found some greens, boiled them for him. One found some geckos, some frogs, roasted them, snapped them in half from catching to releasing. I stayed with my senior, Columban Brother Levandau. He was older. If I escaped, they would surely kill him. Such a scene had happened, lying on both sides. One hiding in the middle. One escaped. A little got caught. All died horribly, so they said. You know, why not confess? So, I escaped. My senior brother, he ate with him, sat with him, slept next to him. How could he not know? If he escaped, no need for a trial any more, they asked me. I missed many chances to escape once they brought me to Don Juan district, to Gala 2, where there was a unified railway line. I could escape if I decorated for people. But there was something hidden in it, a regular shirt, who would wear a prison shirt. If they asked, they'd sweat, they'd change, not me. I caught a cold with a regular shirt, so I could escape. But with a prison shirt, it's hard to escape, with reform written behind. Religious belief propaganda, it affected me most. Such incidents made me fall into a well. So, Australian compatriots knew about it. They said, This guy went to the well. 
and if it were Vietnamese who processed it, he would have been dead. But I fell. I remember clearly August 5th, 1985. It was my turn to stay home to go down the well to draw water. Because it was still summer in August, dot, there was still water in the well in the central region. It was like a conical had down there. That house had 100 siblings sharing one well. They left their plastic bucket. Each took turns staying home for a day to draw and distribute water. That day was my turn to stay home. When I climbed down, there were iron hoops for me to hold. But the second hoop suddenly came off, so I fell from above. About seven meters, hit several buckets. Luckily, plastic ones fainted. I didn't know I was lying down there. They started working. Went to work for three and a half hours before coming back. I lay there, didn't know until the water flooded my face. Went up my nostrils, then I woke up, sat up, couldn't, my legs were paralyzed. Didn't know if I pulled them up, they went up. If I let them down, they fell, numb, painful, at the spinal cord, right at the waist. Maybe it read into the concrete base. I just lay there, raising my head to avoid the water. When they came back, I yelled. So they lowered a rope and pulled me up. Despite being rescued, I remained unconscious for eight months. I didn't know I was lying under there until the water flooded my face and vented my nostrils. Then I woke up and sat up. But my legs were paralyzed, and I didn't know if I pulled them up. They went up. If I let them down, they fell. Numb and painful, the pain was piercing in my spinal column, right at the waist. Perhaps it struck a nerve. I lay there, raising my head to avoid drowning. When they returned, I cried out, and they lowered a rope, pulling me up. Despite being rescued, I remained unconscious for eight months. Upon recovery, when I migrated to Australia and underwent a health check for a citizenship, I mentioned the issue with my spine. When they took x-rays, they noticed it was still misaligned. Yet I didn't feel any pain. It was odd not to feel any pain nor discomfort. And from that moment, I knew for sure that the higher power had plans for me. I didn't know what those plans were in the future, but I tried to find ways to thwart or escape from that intention. Because it's very clear to see you can die without dying. There was a time I suffered from various illnesses, including dysentery, thought I would die in prison or from being paralyzed, as it spread quickly. There was another time when I suffered from severe constipation. Thought I would die. Inmates often suffered from it. I thought I would die from it. But luckily, someone said something. Someone on the other side requested the banana stem nipple. The banana stem had a black nipple. Who would eat it? I chewed three nipples, and I was cured of constipation. It was sour, but it worked. From then on, my brothers searched for banana stem nipples, especially the best ones from the guava, but there were none, so we searched along the roadside. Even in the forest's outskirts, where wild guavas grew, we could also find some dried segments. It worked. If I held on to the ideal of faith in religion, it was because I experienced those terrifying escapes from death. It was so terrifying, terrifying to the point that now I don't believe anymore. From then on, I believed that God's intention was for me to live, and I had to live in a way that pleased him, not to live in fear. In the year one migrated to Australia and obtained permanent residency, the religious order sent me to Rome for a year. Several senior priests said I needed to be brainwashed because they feared. I had been influenced by communism, but there. I had the opportunity to meet with the innocent soul, 
New Yen Van Thuong. During a New Year's retreat in Rome in 1999, he called me out and said, Isn't that so? At that time, I was still a layman. Heard he was sentenced to 13 years in prison. Yes, but I spent 10 years. They released me, Dotma. New Yan Van Lin came to power. He and others only spent three years. So... The bishops weren't prosecuted but spent thirteen years. You laughed. Yes, but those thirteen years were really sad. Nine years in solitary confinement. On that day, you asked, Do you hold a grudge against the communists? I'm Lin, so I asked. Even asked my son for permission to ask the bishop. The bishop had been longer and imprisoned longer. Up to four years. But the bishop is skilled. He doesn't know. The bishop laughed and said, I don't hold a grudge against the communists. I hold a grudge against the ideology that gave birth to them, nurtured them. That ideology is inhuman and religious, destroying human conscience. But I don't hold a grudge against the communists because they are victims. I could use that sentence to answer because it's mine. I don't hold a grudge against them, but I regret that they cling together like a mafia to survive. Because I know the communist ideals are gone. No one has communist ideals anymore, because they know it's a delusion. Countries have lost them long ago, now, simply because the rice pots are stuck together for the sake of eating on the people's heads. It's a pity to see that they seem to have ruined the purity of the younger generation's conscience. They use the pretext of salvation to justify deceitful means. As long as they achieve their desired goals, which is the most harmful thing. Do you see it? That's why I blame them, rightly, not wrongly. If they continue to fight for the empty seats, to destroy the country, the people, and the homeland. They will be guilty in the future history's judgment. I hope that the people can use the teachings of Buddhism, enlightenment, to see the truth, especially to recognize a great disaster that the whole nation must bear. I use the term great disaster not with resentment. It doesn't matter if some say it's pessimistic. A great disaster is attributed to God, not to any deity. God doesn't assign value to make life Buddhist. Some bring that doctrine into the country. Some defend it. Some misunderstand and follow it to fight for it, until it's too late when they open their eyes. That's why if anyone listens to my narrative today, please remember that I don't blame anyone. I just regret, regret for my nation, losing a quite long time. If we had to start over, it would take a long time, because what we destroyed takes a long time to rebuild. A generation that teaches hatred to children. Then a local journalist once said, and he lost his position as the editor-in-chief of the youth newspaper. He knew. He said, if only teaching in textbooks, that one child shoots three Americans. How many children can be taught like that? It's like doing math as how many enemies in one generation. Then how many generations to regain sanity? He answered, it takes for generations to regain it. He lost his position. I read that article and I felt sympathetic to him. Yes, I use the term release to apply to my paper, which I still keep as a cherished memory, thanks to that piece of paper. The Australian Immigration Department reviewed my case more quickly, and I got out of the small prison. Indeed, stepping from a big prison to a family isn't easy. Without household registration, returning to the convent is okay. No registration means you have to report temporary residence every week. I went to 53 B Nguyen Du. It's our school base. So I stayed there temporarily every week. I had to go to the district police station in Ben Ing Ward, District 1, to declare my temporary residence. If I'm absent, I have to request temporary absence during that time. 
are not allowed to appear in public, not allowed to contact the youth. They say it very clearly because every Monday, I have to go to 457 Tran Hundao to report to the police department. And they will ask where you went last week, whom you met, and so on. They keep me relaxed like that. Don't let me go anywhere. Don't allow me to contact. It's pitiful for a Chien Lok's father. He went to buy something, and he went to work, and he also preached about the household registration system, which the driver turned into a hardship, so they spent it. He was sent to prison, rejoiced every day being together, then rejoiced when they returned. They shared everything, even their mats, and I got a mat too. I was so happy, I got to more mats to hold water. The next week they saw me again and asked why I had been released, but went to preach and appear in public, still talking about the hardship of household registration. The whole family spent another five years because of those. Towards, so we're the most careful. Most of the parishes don't dare to open the door for prisoners to come for activities, except for Father Domestica Vovenan. At that time, he was at Hindsey Church. He called me to come today, Mr. Hung comes to have activities. What do I accept from then on? I also have the opportunity to have activities with the youth. They are happier, and it means more to my life. All the rest have nothing to do. Luckily, I returned two years ago. Then, the city sports department issued a decree throughout the city. Needing martial arts trainers before 1975 forget all their ranks from now on. To re-examine to cooperate with the state for healthy activities. That's why I went at that time. Bonds bond nine years old still young to go to for the racetrack to re-examine from the beginning. I looked at the board of judges without anyone I knew. All the martial arts masters from the south I knew. If they were Taekwondo, Karate, Judo, then I knew them all. If they were Karate Masters, then I knew them all. So I asked only politicians, right? No northern politicians to score. That's why I just went to the martial arts section then. I had to go to the martial arts section and then fight. And then break through those three things with physical strength, lying on the ground full. You own he goes, he doesn't know as long as he goes confidently. He posses and fights fights, it's easy, then lie down all so healthy. Then posses a level three years later this year, three years later. He passed the third level, so they allowed me to open a branch that's been in contact with. Infertility. I teach at Sam Van Din Fun Square Big Square. And often miss a beauty pageant each time Miss Universe is my student. From here on out to be orderly of orderly then. There is no master to rely on see the beauty pageant, so I've seen it all happy to think back. That was a period of ten years during which I travelled along. The martial arts path since childhood. Studying under Master Thich Tanjuk at the dojo in Bihu in Gears front yard. Alongside Doc Kao Zhuang Kuang Trang, there were two yards, A and B, and I attended yard primarily. Master Thich Tanjik knew I was a Catholic. I was still young when he passed away in an accident. After his death, our group dispersed. At that time, the Taekwondo movement led by Kuri and Masters was intense. They came to our family compound for free classes. I was very interested, so our family initially had 120 students. But the number dropped to 80 after a week, and eventually, only 20 remained. The instructor liked those 20, so we continued. That's how I got into it. Since childhood, I had been learning Taekwondo for a while. Later, when I participated in a competition in Thudok, I encountered the dojo of Master Dang Thong Fong at the corner of Dean Bean Fu Street. He now teaches Aikido there. I studied directly under Master Dang Thong Fong for three years and became passionate about Aikido. Then, 
I went to prison and learned karate there. So, it wouldn't be accurate to say that I received a Japanese karate certificate before 1975. To clarify, after about seven times, I started teaching at Van Den Fanyodral 1984. Many tourists came, and one day, there was a group celebrating a birthday. I heard they were in prison. I learned a bit of Japanese, because all the guys working at the Japanese consulate were imprisoned for espionage. Blamed on a man I will opt to, Mr. Ohuan. He died in prison at the age of about 80. The Japanese guys came, and they watched, five of them. They were very respectful. With the help of a translator, they asked about the martial arts style. I told them about a very popular style, which they then introduced as the style combining both Sotur and Sotorium, granting me a certificate from which country. I told them I didn't have it with me, but if they returned the next day, I would show them my class. They came back, and then they said that Vietnam didn't issue valid certificates. Only those from their country would allow me to go abroad. I was astounded. How could I study in Japan? I asked for suggestions. They said that I could request permission. From the city sports federation, they allowed us to teach for a free and hold exams. They were so kind. I asked for that permission and they granted it. Thus, we went to my village, which had a spacious yard. Every year, we practiced there for a month. And at the end of the training, there was an exam. So, I received a Japanese certificate. First Dan, then second Dan, and third Dan, which allowed me to participate in international competitions and even the Olympics. Only below that, one could compete but not lead a delegation. It was like a new opportunity to leave the country. To clarify, those certificates were from within the country, not from Japan. The Taekwondo and Aikido certificates from Master Fong were also local. The Japanese certificate I received was after 1985. I've kept those certificates for fun. They represent years of dedication. They were the key and the parachute for me to leave the country. I was very happy. There were three occasions I managed to return, thanks to an American trainer, a former U.S. Marine Corps combatant in Vietnam, stationed in Van Tau. He was an eighth Dan Crotty master, trained in Okinawa since childhood, very tall, about two meters twelve. He came to the dojo before 1975, and on Saturdays, he couldn't take leave. He traveled in his military vehicle from the U.S., based to Saigon. His favorite dojo was Fuji's dojo. When he visited, we trained there. He admired the Quan Trang Road dojo of Master Thich Tanjuk. He took group photos and seemed to forget to return home. He returned to the U.S. Later, he immigrated to Australia because he married a very kind and gentle Chinese woman. Who cared for him? He passed through Australia and stayed with his grandfather in Sydney until 1980, 1981, 1982, and 1983. He sent letters to the Martial Arts Federation. They read some random English poems and only then realized that those poems were on the office of the Secretary General of the Martial Arts Association. That's when they found out that the teacher had been looking for those who appeared in the photos. He sponsored them to go to Australia. So, the first time they went was not because of the Olympics, but because the teacher sponsored them. The teacher had just passed away, and we all really missed him. He said to go abroad to train according to international techniques the laws of others and their patterns, so that if we wanted to participate in international events, we'd be qualified. He also supported me financially. 
I think not only did he say that as long as there was enough money to buy a plane ticket, he wouldn't be rich enough to buy it for us. The first time, many people returned because some were the eyes and ears of the state and followed down to the airport and in the middle, they checked passports and fled. I especially remember the first time. No one thought they'd cut it. They thought like scared rabbits. The second time, they went through. It was almost time for the Olympics training. They all came back. The third time, there was freedom, and no one escaped. Also, I remember I was sitting laughing in the rented house in Sydney when one girl said, tomorrow, the teacher, the guys, and the lady will all be leaving. I have family to worry about. So I'm staying. I don't know about the teacher, the lady, or the guys. When they return, if anything happens, it won't be okay. Just stay here. Then she perked her ears up, and another ear followed suit. That meant she was really intent on going. Who would go if the teacher didn't? I was prepared to go, too. She stayed behind, and I stayed as well taking along the release papers from the prisoner, especially. A paper from the upper echelons of the religious order, handed to me by the superior in Sydney. That's how it happened. That time, the whole group stayed back, not just a segment. In that karaoke period, the taekwondo group also stayed back. The groups were split, but some stayed back. So... For many years, the martial arts groups couldn't go abroad. Only until then, they got the chance. As for me, I applied to be a permanent resident, and they threw out the case, saying I was relying on the poem of the senior brother from Saigon. He had called the senior brother in charge in Australia, the highest authority of the religious province, and handed over the poem. He read it and knew. He said... I know. So, I didn't have to be outside anymore. I stayed within. Then, the factions and teachers took me down to the immigration office and made a declaration. So, two weeks later, my case was accepted. So I was very lucky. I got a health check, a permanent residency permit, and started receiving their subsidies. However, the first time... I remember I laughed a lot. I received the subsidy. The paper had cents from the social office, and they gave it to me, putting it in a bank account. The account had $20, because the faction sent it to open the account for tax purposes. So, I saw myself getting $232.50, very happy. It was the first time I got such a big sum, back then, 28. 230 is two weeks, so one month was for 160. I kept it. I spent little because I thought about my future. Next time, the poem arrived. It had a badge saying, I'm Lynn. The upper brother, Ut, opened it, looked, and said, This is the second time you've received money. Give it back to the monastery. Don't spend it recklessly. From now on, when it comes, don't accept it. So, I didn't accept it continuously for many years until I was 67 years old. Originally, it should have been at 65 when I declared for elderly benefits. That was a very unfair thing. So, when I declared, they said, Why didn't you do it at 65? I said, at 65, I was still working well. Now, at 70, I'm declaring. So, they had sympathy. They said, whenever you're ready. How much do you receive? I said, $232.50 the first time. Still, in the remaining beer, there was nothing left. They said, remember from more than ten years. 
You received social welfare only once, when everyone stayed back, because they went separately. Each had their relatives to worry about Dot at that time. The water puppet troop in Gok River Star had 16 people, all party members, who stayed behind for two days to perform internationally renowned water puppet shows. They were very good at performing. They stayed behind, giving birth and meeting the two groups, before my brothers and I parted ways. Each piece, whoever took it, followed their relatives happily. When we went to the monastery, we met a journalist who asked, When will you still be alive and healthy? Then he introduced, This is the Ngok River Star Water Puppet Troop, and this is the Karate Group that we escaped with. Then we withdrew gradually, because someone had taken care of everything. The Ngok River Star Troop, angry at the communists, was poking Val so they forgot about us, as they were resentful of the dozen or so defectors who had left. About a year and a half later, it seemed that the troop was accepted as political refugees, so fortunately. That was when it happened. Over here, they're all just ordinary people, while over there, they're party members, so, domestically, they condemn them. But my verdict is still pending at the City Sports Association. An elder from the Bat Sanctuary told me last week that a disciple of mine, a martial artist, returned to Vietnam. According to the order, we don't know if we're on the list, but they're being kind not to send us back. I also wanted to return when my mother was still alive. Are there any of you left over there? Everyone was abroad. On what day? The 9th of April, 1998. I went there for the third time, then stayed to attend sports events after that. I participated in the Olympics at that time. There were no permanent residents left, so if anyone says they went to participate in the Olympics, it's not accurate. They went to participate in the training sessions to prepare for the Olympics. That's accurate. So, when staying behind, I didn't have the authority to leave the monastery because I was living off the rich family. So martial arts activities were suspended until I was allowed by the monastery to teach because they sent me to study English in Sydney. After returning from that, I taught pedagogy. When I was allowed to stand in the classroom, I started a martial arts club with some kids who organized it, so I helped for fun. That was a process to say that after I stayed behind. I had some calculations to help, but I had to stop. During that time, after 40 years of being in the circle, turning to each other, now I have to say that I'm free to be born because of the laws of the church and the laws of the order. If you want to become a priest, if we promise not to become priests, it would tear our hearts apart. It hurts a lot. And maybe some of you think that betrayal is insignificant, but it's my own heart. I regret 40 years. Exactly on June 30th, 63, I entered the circle at 14 years old. On August 3rd, 2003, I was born out of the circle exactly 40 years and a few months. So that pain is that, but in terms of service. I wasn't capable enough to help those high school classes who spoke English fluently. I just helped a little in literature. There was a time when I was taught Japanese in sixth and seventh grades, but it didn't work out. When I saw the Vietnamese Catholic community in Sydney, at that time, the first and second generations weren't good at English. They needed people to share the word of God or help them understand the laws of the church about the liturgy. There were few priests. So I decided to change parts. And at that time, if I read the three words go out and find from the ordinary priest, 
I agreed to leave and had to go to find a different direction. I applied that sentence, and I thought about those three words for nearly nine months, before writing a letter to leave the circle and submitting it to the public court. The custom of the religious orders is that. The upper master of the Sydney circle in the laser circle said to me, We introduce you to go abroad, and in your history. There's nothing for us to complain about, so they will accept it. But until you're officially accepted over there, we will release you only when they receive you officially over there. So, it's right that they don't accept you back with us. According to the law, if you go to the other side, they accept. But they wait until they take official church office. One, two, three, four. Five. It's the fourth year. Then they take off us. Reading books. At that time, reading books was a flag. Then they received the office of acolyte, helped with the ceremony. So I reported back there. So they asked for a poem to send to Rome, to confirm my vows in the circle, so I could completely follow the large public court, the big one. The history was like that, about torture or abuse. There were such things. Particularly on the first day, I was caught by an official. I don't know his name. I don't remember any more. He said, are you a martial artist? Because he read that dossier. When you came, the whole group looked like this. This jaw is fake. It all fell out. There are only two or three shaky ones left inside. That's it. They carried you in. That was the first accident. Then, when they started feeding you rice with salt and onions, it healed. Teeth fell out. It wanted to fall out. It didn't let go. It doesn't pick up anymore. Maybe to attach to the upper jaw. Or maybe still good. That was the second thing. The same hand, the same foot, uncomfortable, in the dark. And the third thing is more persistent hunger. The hunger is terrible, and the last thing is, I felt like my dignity was gone. I didn't shout at him, what are you? And so on. And those who called me were younger than me, about nineteen or twenty years old, especially for those over seventy like you. I felt unworthy of human dignity, especially my teacher. He was very short-sighted. He had seven degrees of glasses. He was like this. But we had agreed that when we passed by each other, we would remember the teacher and bring his glasses. One time, he took his glasses and went by. He said, get my glasses back. The land flattened them all. Luckily, the frame was broken, but the lenses were too thick, so they didn't break in the afternoon. We secretly went there to get to other lenses, and made another frame for him from aluminum, aircraft aluminum, because in there we specialized in making cones, clips, and water bottles for officials to take to work and drill rocks. Bring this and that back, thanks to that. They gave us some food to avoid hunger. I was the one who drew. Those guys drilled. So earlier they said they drilled those pictures. We had drawn them. But what did we use to draw? Toothpaste spread it to make it blurry. Then used a matchstick to start drawing. Those ideas followed. It went up. And I used the word suey to be like that. Hitting a lot. Very beautiful then shining on. So from then on, I thought that the first life of a monk was really torture, not play. The second must be less torture later, maybe more subtle torture, abandonment, hunger, disease. There's no medicine, for example, like that. And the way they address it is the saddest thing. The Fatias, the youngest of those people, were younger than me. But why do they call the elders like that? You and I, especially intellectuals, hate to wear glasses. 
which is intellect, so they crushed Teacher Lavandau's glasses all at once. Among the supervisors, anyone with good intentions. I say there are, but the majority are elderly people. I said yes, but most of them are elderly people. A bit, and their root is their old root is a teacher. I noticed three of them like that. Their root is a teacher. Then they were encouraged. Then they went to the military. From the military to the police. Then those people have knowledge. And they have a sense called admiration for the southern prisoners. At first, they thought they were cruel. Eating children. Poking women's eyes or something like that. They spread rumors like that. But later, those people are very kind. They know and they can see the truth, especially if their children are sick. They go to ask for medicine, the medicine of that week. They know their medicine of that year is Zuyon Tamion, which cannot cure anything. They know and they speak to them. They beg for resurrection, so the relationship is closer. They understand each other more. Even later there were officials going to the church of the parish of Gothangir. They went straight to that book to ask for a communion bread for the priests. But when they went, whoever checked it, they understood and if asked if they are good people. I said, of course. In every person, there are good and bad people. But the bad ones usually have a memory or a nightmare. It's very bad for them against the southern regime. A large number of them are young victims in the north. There are those of B-50 to aircraft families who died with a terrible hatred for the south, but later they went to protect the southern prisoners, to solve the math problems because they don't know sheep or they don't know the language of pity. So they learn. They even learn English. The wives ask for it. So, mister. Tongue just called us a dictionary army. Which dictionary is it in the set? Just keep it. But when you go to study, the officials also bring it. That's it. Just the thinnest dictionary. Turn than mine. Then the dictionary of Le Bie Seng Kong. So those dictionaries they buy, they bring to Nha Trang. They buy every time they go in. The prisoner writes an article for the officials. They write a few words for themselves, so in prison there is a dictionary to share, to learn to write on the paper wrapped in medicine for everyone to put in. The medicine box, then it won't be discovered. So they just take out one sheet to study. Today, this one learns five words. That one learns five words. It's very useful. Also thanks to those people. They come into contact with southern prisoners. They see their value and what they have been propagandized is not correct. So they can make friends. So I answer, not everyone is bad, but if they're bad is also reasonable because they're victims of some massacre. So if in contact, they're also changed. So remember. The story of Cardinal Nguyen Van Thun. They changed other people constantly. One person every six months. Everyone at risk of being affected by this prisoner. We witnessed an execution at Camp A20. Clearly that time there were officers organizing gun raids beyond the camp. And those people went to escape. One was stepped on thorns, but he knew the central is thick, so he didn't wear shoes. They don't let you wear shoes out of the camp. They say go and escape. If anyone is smart, then thanks to the elders voluntarily. That means they go to cut wood, sneak out to bury their shoes somewhere so they know they bring him. He steps on thorns. He stays. He gets caught again. Levan Beer, the name of those people, happened to sit and watch, execute that person. He had to sit and watch to scare, so that no one else escapes. Press right there, though. Van holds the name of that person. All a whole camp how many people don't need to know can get out is to sit. 
and watch the progress they pulled out and stood there anymore. He stands up, he can't stay anymore. He's weak, then they say this is the verdict of the Ministry of Internal Affairs. Of the Republic Socialist Vietnam, independent freedom happiness so from then on. Those gentlemen write long wings is independent, but except freedom, except happiness, it is longer. Then minus happiness, anything to trial should people escape. And say, he is sentenced to life imprisonment. And escape, then increase sentence, increase sentence, so from life imprisonment to death row. Read, finish, shoot, sick, disease, and so on. So the prisoner is carried away to escape, escape, then also have a bowl of rice to incense with. Grass egg, so those people are cut, buried, it enjoy the egg at new rice. It helps out, asks Mr. The for us teeth that witnessed at other camps, then I also heard. But I wasn't there, didn't know, on February 17th, 1979. China sent troops to fight six border provinces then that day. We, I was the deputy team leader of a team full of priests with monks with teachers. Then the team leader, deputy team leader, didn't have any rights other than the right to go to the warehouse before going to work then go to. The cold storage, one bundle of national examples there. Team of twenty people I sold ten hoes is near death, dad captain is Mr. To Nu Yun, he died in Vietnam 10k because they didn't say. Didn't allow me to hold the hoe to go along CMM road to attack them so tie back the captain. Carry the deputy leader carry me to receive the nation. Then hear the speaker say today the warehouse is not open all go to the whole thousands of people. Go to the whole sit close. To each other you believe you also think you work. Then wear a shirt that smells of sweat the most. Because there are only two shirts the last weekend to wash God smells happy. It's happy then sit like this I like this the principal came in with major. General Nuyun Van Bienji to slam the table and say today we leaders of Ba Kwai and China plan to annex. Our country send troops too. Occupy six northern provinces that officer said. We would rather be demons of the south than kings of the north, so he said quite loudly. He called to listen to what nonsense. He said nonsense, who said here the team leader is a lieutenant that phrase of Tun Bie Entruden. Threw away mister. Tun Bie Entruden sent the captain up to meet me immediately. Even though thousands of people smiled, he asked what the captain teacher I heard. But it must be that person explaining where he is from it's okay to skip the story of Mr. Tunbie Entrigan especially, when it says like that Mr. Tunbie Entrigan went to see me then the team leader said. He had died long ago it said how could he die like that that's a story, but immediately after that. There was a priest going down to support him is used to looking down saying that guy that guy why. Is he from take him out to the flagpole tie him up. Pity for him to be tied to the sun. After disbanding, no, there is chaos in prison, listen to wherever there is chaos. Then rejoice in that chaos where I said, Father, why is Father laughing what pushes me to be a priest? Is to serve the first and second generations English is not enough. Cannot attend church in Australia then, that's the motivation, it must be so. After the priest's death according to the law of the Australian bishop's court, any priest know? Matter what nationality, whether Australian or Vietnamese, must serve in Australia for. Three years to get used to the young people. I also stayed three years in Australia then, when used to them. They sent me back Vietnamese Catholic community. I am very happy I am here until now, of course. In the Vietnamese Catholic community. When speaking English, it's gone. That habit, it stutters again. It's been 15 years. It's been Vietnamese 20 for sevenths. But feeling happy is because after 15 years, it sees the result is people feel happy when they go to church. They feel happy not understanding the word of God and the liturgy. They see that generation go slowly then all gone. Then the day before I went here to mourn those three people. 
The first generation just slowly, slowly, the second generation doesn't need me anymore. It's good at English how long for me to do then the day I interviewed with the director of the Institute and the Bishop of the West. They asked me. Before the interview was over, they asked if I had anything to request. I said I requested six years for the child to study according to the law six years. Then another year of internship is seven years, then I look surprised. I didn't answer, but they looked at each other, then one replied to Long, I am afraid you will die. Before the day you are ordained as a priest, then you only use the phrase. We are afraid that you do engagement, then he applies the law of the church. I only lost two years at minimum, I can learn more. I read that I finished. Then give two years to study about the sacraments is what I need and serve is what I need. Then those two years I do assistant after six months I am a priest in 2006 the day. I am a priest I myself at home I am old alone a period alone fortunately my mother survived and came back. Then she died with my sister has to people. Before there was no means to call a village then offline I still share my time I am in Vietnam. I also recorded video back then cassette, because of what I share right from when I was still in Vietnam. I tell myself, I tell those whom I care for, it will be different. I don't say to propagate knowledge or experience. I speak sincerely to those I care for. I am influenced by the teachings of Thichen Hat Han, although many assess it differently according to their own views. But I like his saying, Whatever you do, do it with your heart. If you meet a child, speak to the child with your heart. Love it sincerely. It senses that immediately. But wherever you go, before appearing outwardly, you must think inwardly. I must love this place. And what I say comes from lived experience, not theory. The listeners can feel it. They sense the love. It's like a wave. And I'm further reinforced by the thoughts of the Dalai Lama. He says, only appear with love. Even the atmosphere is different with love. It's different when it appears with a pessimistic mindset. It affects even the lifting of a weight. So don't pay attention to appearances. That's it. Hello. Love and in your mind. Say, I love you all. You are only here. That's it. So... It's not about technique or eloquence. It's not about the content or arrangement of words. It's about the key point. The key point lies in your heart. When you transmit something from the heart, it enters the hearts of others. We are Vietnamese. You, Vietnamese. We are Vietnamese. Regarding religion, I'm proud of the tradition of our ancestors because the Vietnamese spirit is courageous and brave. Accepting death, that's something to be proud of. First, there's pride. Second, I don't know if it can be a hundred percent like the first pride, but that's how I see it. The expression of faith among Catholics, both domestically and abroad is specific and might still be inferior to our Muslim brothers and sisters. Because they express openly. They chant prayers aloud because they have no fear outside. No fear of anyone. But the specific expression, for example, still maintains faith through traditions like participating in liturgy. Through practices like devotion to the Sacred Heart of Mary. The devotion to the Divine Mercy, and so on. There are still people who participate, and I'm proud of that because faith is still alive. Furthermore, I'm proud of the achievements of our descendants, the next generations, who are so talented. It's not about clinging to the land for a sustenance, but about contributing many talents, even within the clergy, like Father Lean in the U.S., who now has an additional Vietnamese bishop. Or Father Long, the Franciscan friar in Australia, our dear Vietnamese. In Australia, there are a few ladies who ask me if I'm a famous tea maker. So, they hope the price of my tea will go up. I said no. 
I just like being a pastor. The term pastor used to mean a pope. They wonder why I say that. I tell them, pastor means me. I mean me. Then they scold me and say, that's why you're like that. But what I mean is that I'm proud. Not only in the aspect of expressing faith specifically, but faith must also be expressed through actions. And the achievements of our descendants prove that. We are diligent, intelligent, patient people who progress when given the opportunity. So, it's regrettable that those under the influence of atheism sleep through lavish parties, completely unaware of any higher values than the value of indulgence. I feel sorry for that generation, feeling joy in the spiritual realm. The first way is to directly reach the holy place, to touch it. The Eucharist is a miracle that cannot be explained scientifically. The second is feeling that I can share blessings with my brothers and sisters in a specific way. Back then, in the order, in Sydney, visiting the largest prison. Whether in Long Bay or Silver Water, everyone thought I was going to confess. The monk doesn't have the authority to sit and hear confessions anymore. But now, if someone asks, I just say yes. Please feel free. It's different now. That's serving. I can directly help patients, anoint them with oil, etc. I find joy in serving over the years in prison. I learned one thing. First, I believe in the saying. Human proposes, God disposes. Second, I learned that freedom is the most precious. Nothing equals it. Third, I feel that everyone has an immortal soul. These three things nurture my faith. And if the soul is immortal, then I must equip it with something to bring to the other side. Of course, it can't carry material objects. Therefore, freedom is given to respond to the call from above. But I also have the right to resist. It's up to me. Therefore, human proposes, God disposes is a lesson. I believe it in my heart. Second, freedom is nothing more valuable. And third, I think that everything is God's grace. So, I ask everyone to cherish their freedom and remember that Adam and Eve, our ancestors, also used their freedom wrongly, going against the divine will. So, please remember to plan. But it's not like God's plan. Especially since God has his way, not like mine. And I accept that. It's his providence and freedom is precious. It's about how to encourage the youth, both domestically and abroad. I believe that everyone has a very high consciousness. They know, and if they are not dependent on materialistic temptations, then deep inside, they still have a conscience, which in Vietnamese is called Ling, meaning goodness, it's a basic conscience, especially, I like the term Ling Tri, which means a good understanding. So, rely on conscience and good understanding. They recognize that freedom is the most precious gift from God, and nothing surpasses it. Therefore, they must have the courage to demand that freedom if they see it but don't possess it. Just like many current protests in mainland China, I hope that young people domestically also understand that their freedom is the most precious gift, invaluable, bestowed by God, and if they misuse it, they're wasting its energy. So, I hope you understand that it might be my message. I dare not say. It's advice about preserving the history of those after 1975 because freedom is what the soul seeks. Amidst adversity, I'm not a historian, but I go to see with my own eyes the situation of those people. I believe that if seen or heard, only then can we relive the memories. How can we see if we don't hear? If no one preserves these relics, it's said that every country needs it, Every discipline needs it. Science has it, arts have it, and medicine has it. Therefore, 
The painful history of the Vietnamese people after the loss of the country needs to be recorded. Not as a reminder, but as a warning. Don't let a similar page of history open again. It reminds us, look back at how many people sacrificed. How many people died? So, the work that the museum is nurturing, incubating, and carrying out is necessary. It's not just about fostering, but it has to bloom. It's not just a pregnancy, it has to be born. And it has to give birth to results that people come to visit, contribute, and participate in preserving all the painful memories of our nation. After that catastrophe that everyone acknowledges was a catastrophe that should never that should never have happened.